Hi, welcome to Green TV, the show dedicated to Green New Deal positive solutions. Independent Greens advocate for solar jobs, wind jobs, geothermal jobs, rail jobs, weatherization jobs, conservation jobs. I have uh, today with us uh, Kate Alexandrova. Kate? Hello. Hi. Hello, Gail. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. And we also have Lois Gibbs. And uh, Kate, would you introduce Ms. Gibbs for us? Uh, Lois Gibbs uh, has been recognized extensively for her critical role in the grassroots environment justice movement and what it actually means. We all know that Green Party is all about new solutions, positive solutions, and Ms. Gibbs here is the one who really knows how to uh, bring those to life and how to bring real positive change uh, to communities. Um, could you please uh, give us a little bit um, about your story, how it started, about uh, your journey, um, and about the Love Canal, which is a great, great story to hear. And I want you to share it with our viewers. Oh, yes, I'd be happy to. It's a great story to hear, but not one to live through. So um, I actually started all of my work w was in Niagara Falls, New York, and that is where the Love Canal dump site, Love Canal is a dump site, um, after William T. Love. That's where it received its name, who built it. Um, it was a dump site that was located underneath the elementary school that my children were attending. Uh, and three blocks from my home. And it had 20,000 tons of chemicals in it. Chemicals that were just, I couldn't even pronounce. I mean, the names were just huge. Um, these chemicals over time had leaked out of the dump site. It moved through the ground, as most dump sites do, and, and ended up in our basements, in our air, in our backyards, in our gardens, and more importantly, in our bodies. And as a result of that at Love Canal, Many, many people were sick. There were 900 families who lived there, uh, including myself, obviously. And what we found when we looked at the health after people were exposed to these very toxic chemicals was that women were unable to carry babies full term, uh, that many women had stillborn babies. But more importantly, 56% of our children were born with birth defects. And these birth defects include things like extra fingers, extra toes, or mentally this retarded. This is outrageous. So it, how did you um, fight this whole situation? It is outrageous. It was outrageous. But I mean, this is still happening today across the country, by the way. But um, what we did is we decided to empower ourselves to fight against huge corporate interests. The corporation was a multinational corporation with billions of dollars in profit. Um, and we were up against some of the strongest government, the federal government, the state government. But what we did is we built local power by educating ourselves, by getting ourselves together, forming a group, and really pushing those people who had the ability to make change, to fix the problem, to relocate us from the community, to do it. And they weren't doing it very happily, but they did it. And what was amazing about it, I think, it shows how our democracy in this country works, is that when people do get educated and when people do stand up and they do take a position and they work hard, you can win things. One of the things that we won at Love Canal was not just the ability for everybody to move out of there because there was no way you could live there safely, but we won a piece of federal legislation called the Superfund. And that's a, a, that's a fund of money that was collected from industries who make these toxic chemicals through a tax. And then that fund is available for the next site, like Love Canal, where if people are sick, there are some resources there to help them to remedy the situation, whether it's cleaning up or something else. It was a very frightening journey. You know, democracy, we say very quickly, oh, that's people participating. It's not easy to participate. You need courage. It's, it's, it's scary. But I'm telling you, it works so well. I mean, it's just something that we teach people every day now to, to do. Okay, so it worked in 1978. That's when the whole thing happened, I believe. Would you say, would you say it's easier to do it now, or what, actually what would have changed since then? 
I actually do think it's about the same. It's not easier, it's not harder. Maybe passing federal legislation is a little more difficult because of the gridlock on the Hill that obviously did not exist back in 1978, 1980. Um, but people can make a difference. And the thing is that people think that these issues are too big to do, um, too big to get their arms around. And actually, most of them, like Love Canal, were, were fought in one locally. There was nobody from a giant environmental group who said, gee, we need a policy to deal with, su with these you know, super toxic chemicals like Superfund. That actually came from the grassroots on up. Um, when you're looking at other green issues, when you're looking at the green economy, when you're talking about solar panels, when you're talking about alternative uh, winds, windmills and things like that, you're really talking about local issues. The federal government isn't going to decide a windmill should be in Falls Church, Virginia or Wisconsin. That's a decision that's going to be made locally. So the truth is that most decisions are made locally, most change happens locally, and then it builds itself up to a national level. And you have programs now that you're working on here in Fairfax County, uh, Lloyds. Would you tell us a little bit about those programs? We have a number of programs we're working with. We're working with communities throughout um, the state of Virginia, Fairfax County in particular. Um, a lot of it has to do with energy. Actually, it has a lot to do with pipelines and um, the extraction of natural gas and the opposition in communities across the state. Um, to that um, issue. And then we're working with um, communities across Fairfax County, but across the, the country on children's projects. Um, projects like our Green Flag Program, which is about bringing leadership skills to young people that our future of this country whether we, whatever we do now is really based on what do the young people learn, what do the young people do, and how to move that forward. So, so we have a number of programs. So let me, I, I brought some show and tell for you. Right. That is nice. So, yeah, so, so one of the things we have, it's called the Green Flags Program, and I don't know if you can see that, but this is for elementary school, and, and the, issue, the issue really is around um, educating children about how they can be leaders. So, so this is a whole kit. It has pages and pages that we can't show you on TV, but they can get it from our website. And, and what it does is it talks to students about how do you become leaders? How, you know, putting together a green team in your school and start talking about what's good about the school. Like I said, all, all issues are solved locally on up, they're not from the top down. So young people in school are really, really important. So, so they can put a green team together, and the green team can, it's really hard to say fast, the green team can then decide what they wanna work on, and there's a way to do an inventory um, in their school. And the four issue areas we're looking at is pesticide use, recycling, um, air quality, um, or uh, cleaning products, essentially. That's the easiest one, it's product juice, but cleaning products. And so the students will form a team and then they'll go and do a survey and they will ask the administrator and the custodial staff and others, what are we doing here? Are we, are we contributing to the environmental problem? Um, or are we avoiding environmental problems? So looking at um, what do they do with their paper? Are they all throwing it away or are they pulling it together and recycling it? There is the Herndon High School here in Fairfax County has a program in which they actually collect not only the recyclables at their school, but they collect it from local businesses around the school. Of course, the parents are a big factor in this because the young people can't drive. And, um, and then they put it in a dumpster and then it gets weighed and it gets sold to recycling you know, facilities. This is paper and um, as well as glass and aluminum. And out of the money they raise, they do scholarships. So you have to be part of this leadership team 
in order to qualify for a scholarship. And as being part of this team, you must contribute, which means you might have to ride on the truck one day to collect stuff with your parents or someone else's mom uh, or dad. And, and it's a really great program. But what it shows students is not only leadership and teamwork, um, but it shows them how they can make a difference and they can make money. Recycling doesn't cost money, it actually provides money to the Herndon High School for the purpose of small scholarships. It's, you know, they don't raise a ton of money, but small scholarships towards college. So, so that is our program. We have one, the one I held up, this one, is for the elementary school children. And then this one is for high school. So, so that the, the information and the, the fact sheets and stuff like that are age appropriate. There is uh, material for teachers to do class, you know, sort of classwork around it. And, and, um, and if they fill out their form and send it to us and decide which of the four areas they want to um, do, whether it's pesticides or air or products or um, recycling, we actually, free of charge, we know schools don't have any money, um, we actually will send them a flag. This is a real flag. They can actually put on their flag post. And uh, what are the, what do the pictures represent? So where you see those four squares, when they finish, for example, the recycling program, so there's a, there's a thing they have to do. Uh, when they finish it, they get a little patch that adheres to the square on the flag that has recycling. And in this case, it's the one in the upper left-hand corner. I think it's left. <laughs> and, then, and then they earn each one of those flags. And, when they, and so each, each time they earn the flag, the other thing it does for young people is it says, we've done something. We got a flag, we did our inventory, we've moved on this issue, and now we have a patch. It's almost like if you think about Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts, you know, the kind of thing where they earn the patches. They're not just given to them. If they do not send to us what they've done and how they've done it and so forth, they don't get a patch. I mean, they really mm -hmm. do have to earn it. Um, and so, and then they could put this in their school, in their front lobby, or they can put it in their science class, whatever they want to do. But it's an important program because, not just because it helps improve the environment where they spend most of their time and obviously the school personnel, it's an important program because it develops leadership. Because these students now have to sit down with the custodial staff and say, in a very polite and respectful way, what kind of chemicals are you using to clean the restrooms? What kind of chemicals are you using to clean the floor? Can I see what's in the ingredients of those? So we don't want the children to walk around, obviously, with chemicals, but the label is safe. You know, can I see the label of what this is? And is there a better chemical we could use or product we can use? And then they have to go and negotiate with the principal and said, you know, the custodian's been using this, but we'd really like to use this. Well, most principals will say, well, we can't do that because we buy in bulk. All the schools in Fairfax County, for example, buy the same um, product. So now you have to go to the school board and you have to talk to the school board. So these students are going, learning that you don't start from the school board and work your way down, but you start from your school and you work your way up. And I have yet to see a school board who has been resistant to this. Now, they might say, um, and I can't remember precisely what Fairfax County said, but um, they might say, we can't do this because we have a contract for X amount of time, but after that contract expires, we can you know, then purchase different products, for example. But it's, it's just a way that students learn how to get through the system. So when they're older, if they, if they want to work on clean energy or if they want to work on fixing a toxic waste dump or something like that, they sort of have basic skills about how to start that, how to get their community together in this class, community in the school, um, and work their way through so the system. So you're actually training um, <coughs> environmental activists, as it were. How many schools do you have involved in the program now? Can you tell me what they are? Um, we have schools at all levels, including preschool, which is kind of amazing. But of course, everything is read to the preschoolers. But they do form their little team, and, and they essentially just do recycling. Um, but we have schools all across the country. So we have schools in Florida, in California, um, at all different levels. Um, students have really taken a lot of pride. We've had one group of students, these were students from the Philadelphia area, 
who did the, the, older, the older group, the high school level. Um, these are students who are students at risk, um, and so they, they're, a little, they're a little unconventional, if you will. Um, they did this whole thing, and there was a donor who said, if you complete the flag and do all of the steps in it, I will personally fund a bus to drive you to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice. That's the organization that we run. Um, and then you could do some touring and see how government works. And these students were fabulous. So they came from Philadelphia. We, we provided pizza and you know soda and milk and other things for them. Um, and then I went around the room and I said, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I mean, again, these are troubled students, so I was expecting something you know, a little different than you would ask a normal population. And, and the one guy said, well, I wasn't going to be anything but like a laborer working in one of the factories or something like that. But now that I went through this process, I realized I'm a leader. I might be president of the United States someday. Well, that is, I, I thought it was nice to hear. Well, as someone who's traveling a lot around the country, do you feel that um, the level of awareness, uh, environmental awareness, raised significantly over the course of last years, recent years? Oh, most definitely, and certainly since Love Canal. I mean, back back in the 1980s, so that shows you how old I am, but back in the 1980s, recycling was something the hippies did, right? The love children, or whatever they used to call them. Um, and now, if you don't recycle, people just look at you like there's something socially wrong with you. There, you know, that, that, that has changed dramatically. People's habits have changed. You know, people are not buying those toxic chemicals they once used to buy. So you don't see them going to to their local hardwood store or grocery store and picking up the most toxic of toxics to clean that germ in the bathroom. You know, that they really are thinking about what is safe for me, what is safe for my family. And why that's important is because that product is manufactured somewhere. Um, and then it's used somewhere, and if it's used in a toilet, for example, it goes down to our sewage system, and then it goes out into our drinking water supply or our rivers and streams, even though it's filtered somewhat. Uh, and the container then has to be disposed of. So, you know, the whole life cycle is, has changed, and I, I think people are much more in tune with the environment now than ever before. I think that we still have serious problems that, um, that are a little more difficult to get our hands around, you know, back in the 80s, they had smokestacks. You go to Pittsburgh and you would just, or Buffalo, where I'm from, you would just see this black smoke all over, you know, the air. And now the chemicals are still in our air, but they're just not as visible. And the invisibility of those chemicals make it a little more difficult for people to get their arms around to say, yeah, I think that, I think that well, thing is hurting us. Here's where I was uh, going with this. Uh, we know that Green Party candidates they have to go against two large parties all the time. Mm -hmm. And it is really hard because of the lack of resources. But most importantly, um, I have a strong feeling that uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, how important those green issues and those green positive solutions actually are. They're no less important than any other political, social, or cultural issues we face in everyday life. And uh, do you feel that it actually uh, helps in uh, enabling and uh, uh, backing up those positive solutions, effective solutions that Green Party candidates are trying uh, to uh, bring to their voters? I, I do. I, I really do, because people do associate green with green, obviously. Uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but I think, I think one of the things that, that people, where the confusion happens, is people think, well, if I, if I am green locally, that's not going to help us in the bigger thing. But yes, it, absolutely. And, and I'm here to tell you that's just wrong that if you want to change this country, whether you're a Green Party or a different party, you need to start locally, and green is the answer. People are looking to green. Green is cheaper. Green is a new economy. I mean, we have opportunity for economic development around green that is huge, that we are not taking advantage of for the same reason. You have the infrastructure, which is all about the old infrastructure, right? And so you can't, 
you can't move it. But then again, a lot of people think that buying eco-friendly green products is, it, they are more expensive sometimes. So they do need a strong incentive in order for them to change their consumers' habits, yeah. their patterns of behavior. Uh, and uh, what do you have to bring to the table as far as uh, the customer's, um, the, the um, consumer's behavior goes? Well, there, there's two things. It is a little more expensive in some areas and not in others. So we shouldn't say they all are. For example, some organic food, if you were to buy that, that would be more expensive in your local grocery store than a non-organic food. But you're going to pay less medical bills, right? Because you're not going to be poisoned by the, the hormone you know, disrupting chemicals in that food and the pesticide and, and the early onset of cancer or asthma. I mean, I think we, we have to stop looking, and this is, goes to politics too. I mean, that's a problem with politics. Politics is all about four years, right? We need to stop looking at today and figure out what is the longer vision. So, and, and, and as it relates to food, there are many, many efforts out there um, and in fact, I just came back from Colorado, where they have all these gardens, these urban gardens, these food yeah. gardens, and, and what they do with these gardens is they grow this food and they give it to people who are of lower income, right? So, so people with wealth can eat healthy, and people Yeah, with, they do have that kind of urban garden in D.C. Yeah. as well, and yes. maybe not, not even one. No, they have many, and it's a growing, it's really a growing society, and so that is a place, you want to do political organizing, that is a place I would go and visit, because these are people who get it. They absolutely get it. Um, and then the other thing is consumers, and, and especially young consumers, they do not have a clue how powerful they are. So we had a campaign against um, Victoria's Secrets, an intimate brand. Uh, intimate brand owns Victoria's Secrets and Bath and Body Works. What we want them to do was stop using this plastic container, which is PVC plastic. It's essentially plastic with chlorine. You have plastic with and without. This is the most toxic in its production. It, it puts stuff in the air, and Louisiana is where the main production is, and there's Cancer Alley, they call it. I mean, it's just a horrible situation. So, so and then in your use, when you, when you have a container with PVC, chlorine, the chemicals, the estrogen chemicals, leak out of the container and into your product that you're spreading on your face or you're, if it's mouthwash, you're putting it in your mouth and swishing it around and then when the product is complete, you throw it away. You can't recycle PVC. You can recycle those drink bottles that you see all the time and you probably use. PVC you cannot recycle. So did you win this fight? Not only did we win it, uh, we won it in three months based on young people sending emails to Intimate Brand, that's the, the mother, uh, the mothership, if you will. Um, so when we won it, I was walking down the hall with the, with the guy from Intimate Brand who came to announce that they had won, we had won, and I said, why? What made, what is it that happened that made you change your mind? And what he said is that young people between 18 and 27 years of age develop their brand loyalty. So you, whatever you're using during that time will be the brand you use the rest of your life. You may vary from there occasionally, but if you've always used Clairol, you'll always use Clairol. If you always use, you know, Dow's product, you'll always, whatever it is, you get those brand loyalties in. We were, we were affecting that population. That is the population who is wow, writing that is letters. Wow, very impressive. Yeah. So they actually, they changed the way they make their containers. They changed the ingredients right. they use. Based right. upon the young people. Based on the young people and the fact that they don't want those young people to walk away at that age because they won't come back. So, so, you know, they wanted them. So young people, that's what I say to young people all the time. Find an issue you care about and then find a product associated with it. And every single product, there is an 800 consumer number that you can call about that product. I tell them, call that number. When you get mad at your girlfriend, call that number. When you get mad at your teacher, call that number. When your mom gets angry and she grounds you for something, if you're that young, call that number. And, and just talk about the product. Obviously, don't talk about your mother or your teacher. And, and it's, really, it's really kind of exciting. And that's, that's how you move the power 
um, to you know to people to make that change. And we've won. We've won. A, McDonald's rolled over on styrofoam. They had their sandwiches in styrofoam. That campaign. Um, changed the way McDonald's has their sandwich wraps now because young children all across the country in a, a very short period of time, <clears throat> excuse me, went to McDonald's and said, please wrap my sandwich in paper. And the guy would say, I can't do that. This is a franchise. We must wrap everything exactly the same no matter where it is. And he says, but I can't buy it unless it's in paper. And this one child started crying. Well, the news media was there and they filmed it and it went all across the United States with a small child crying because he couldn't get his sandwich, right? Because this big ogre wouldn't put it in paper, which is environmentally sound. So McDonald's stopped using styrofoam in their sandwiches. It was a local action by children all across America that changed a big corporation like McDonald's. So young people, you know, really young people, not us gray hairs here, have the ability to change this country if they would only realize that and use it. That's the problem. This is truly amazing. Now, <coughs> Green's got the power. And aren't these stories by uh, Lois Marie Gibbs uh, the best yeah. proof <laughs> of that? Um, thank you for being here with us. Uh, the host is uh, Gail Farrell Parker. Uh, my name is Kate Alexandrova, and here goes uh, my shout out to our fabulous crew in the control room, Director Kerry Rafter, uh, Martin, uh, Martin Dale, and Happy Garcia, and Maddie Garcia. Uh, thank you all for making this happen, and we hope you will join Green TV next time. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today.